This is Space Time Series 25, Episode 36, for broadcast on the 25th of March, 2022. Coming up on Space Time, Solar Orbiter about to make its closest approach to the Sun, NASA's Planetary Defense System detects an asteroid before impact, and a nova explosion demonstrates cosmic particle acceleration at its limit. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. The joint NASA-ESA Solar Orbiter spacecraft has now passed the orbit of Mercury, the nearest planet to the Sun, and will shortly, meaning tomorrow, make its closest approach to the Sun. It's an important encounter. Because of its position and relative proximity to Earth, Solar Orbiter has so far been able to stay in almost continual contact, beaming back loads of data. And the processing of that data is happening quickly. For example, the magnetometer data is being processed and cleaned up within roughly 15 minutes of being recorded. And that 15 minutes also includes the three and a half minutes it takes for the signals themselves, travelling at the speed of light, to travel between the spacecraft and the Earth ground stations. Solar Orbiter is currently around 75 million kilometres away from the Sun. And that's about the same distance that the spacecraft achieved during its last close flyby of the Sun back on June 15, 2020, but still nothing compared to how close it will eventually get. Solar Orbiter Project Manager Daniel Mueller from ESA says from this point onwards we're all entering the unknown as far as Solar Orbiter's observations of the Sun are concerned. Tomorrow, Solar Orbiter will be less than a third of the distance from the Sun to the Earth. Luckily, it's designed to survive this close to the Sun for relatively extended periods of time. For example, during this close encounter, it's spending from March the 14th through until April the 6th, soaking up the blistering heat inside the orbit of Mercury. Around perihelion, the name for the closest approach to the Sun, Solar Orbiter will bring online its high-resolution telescopes, operating closer to the Sun than ever before. Together with data and images from Solar Orbiter's other 26 instruments, these could reveal more information about the Sun than ever before, including more information on some miniature flares, which mission scientists have dubbed campfires, that had never been seen before. Scientists want to know if these dynamical features, which are seen in the extreme ultraviolet, extend into the solar wind. The Sun releases a constant stream of charged particles, known as the solar wind. These charged particles, which carry a magnetic field, eventually reach the Earth. And when they're strong enough, they create the northern and southern lights, the aurora borealis and aurora australis. But they can also disrupt technology, damaging spacecraft, hampering communication and navigation systems, disrupting terrestrial power grids on the Earth's surface, and increasing radiation doses for astronauts in space. Magnetic activity on the sun, often taking place above sunspots, can create gusts of the solar wind enhancing these effects. This behaviour is known as space weather, and scientists have placed Solar Orbiter on a trajectory specifically to study space weather in a unique way. They'll combine Solar Orbiter's observations with those of other spacecraft operating nearer to Earth, such as High Node and Iris, which are in Earth orbit, and SOHO, the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory spacecraft, which is stationed 1.5 million kilometres from Earth in the so-called Earth-Sun Lagrangian L1 position, a sort of gravitational well between the Sun and the Earth. Combining data from all the different satellites at once will allow scientists to join the dots of any space weather event as it crosses the 150 million kilometres between the Sun and Earth. Solar Orbiter's remote sensing instruments may also be able to pinpoint the origins of any event on the solar surface. And even if no solar event takes place, there's still a lot of science that can be performed in analysing the evolution of the same packet of solar wind as it travels outwards from the Sun into the solar system. Solar Orbiter will use its array of 10 remote sensing instruments to image the Sun and its 27 in situ instruments to measure the solar wind as it flows past the spacecraft. This report from ESA TV. So the Orbiter's first close approach to the Sun has enabled us to for the first time operate all 10 instruments on board together. 
Initially, they had been checked out one by one, like tuning individual musical instruments, and now it was time for them to perform together for the first time. Never before has a camera been this close to the sun. The process of checking out the 10 instruments and a total of 27 telescopes and sensors on board has been hampered by the COVID-19 pandemic. For the first time, spacecraft commissioning was carried out from people's homes, an effort that's paid off. Receiving this first science data was really exciting. We see already little features we haven't seen before, like little flashes of light that look a little bit like solar flares, but are much, much smaller than the solar flares we used to know. The scientists refer to these flashes as campfires. They could be part of the process that heats the outer layer of the sun's atmosphere, the corona. And although the mission's at an early stage and the instruments aren't fully calibrated, these results provide a tantalising glimpse of the discoveries to come. This first data allows us to tune the software on board, to calibrate the images even better, so that we can get ready for the real science phase and for even closer approaches to the sun. Solar Orbiter has a long journey ahead of it. The spacecraft will study the solar wind, the stream of charged particles the sun emits, producing more useful science. Having been involved in Solar Orbiter for over 13 years, it's been an amazing moment to see the first data and images because this is something that I have been waiting for as a scientist for many years. And following this entire process from conceiving the spacecraft, building it, launching it, and then see it actually work in orbit is fantastic. And this is only the beginning. Solar Orbiter is already giving us a new understanding of our neighbourhood star and its influence on the Earth. And in that report from ESA TV, we heard from Solar Orbiter Project scientist Daniel Mueller from ESA and ESA Instrument Operations scientist Anique de Groove. This is Space Time. Still to come, NASA's planetary defence system successfully detects an asteroid before impact and a nova explosion demonstrates cosmic particle acceleration at its limit. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Okay, let's take a break from our show for a word from our new sponsor, and it's a fellow podcaster, the I Am Bio podcast. Where do biotechnology, politics, patients, and our planet all intersect? Find out by listening to the I Am Bio podcast. You know, it can be hard keeping up with the latest biotechnology news and breakthroughs. The world of biotechnology is always moving forward at a rapid pace. And it can be hard to stay informed and on top of the latest advances. And that's where the I Am Bio podcast comes in. Hosted by Dr. Michelle McMurray-Heath, President and CEO of the Biotechnology Innovation Organization, this weekly podcast brings you powerful stories of biotech breakthroughs. You'll hear about everything from new vaccine technologies, the latest Alzheimer's research, and topics like the biggest threats to our planet's water supply, all in a relaxed and friendly format. For example, a couple of great episodes I found while visiting the website included one entitled Antimicrobial Resistance, The Silent Pandemic. And there was another interesting one there called Escaping the Food Allergy Prison. So why not check them out? Just go to bio.org forward slash podcast. That's bio.org slash podcast. Or you can simply subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. That's bio.org slash podcast. And of course, as always, there'll be links in the show notes and on our website. And now, it's back to our show. This is Space Time with Stuart Gary. For only the fifth time ever, astronomers have been able to predict an asteroid impact on Earth before it happened. The asteroid, catalogued as 2022 EB5, hit the Earth's atmosphere and disintegrated over the Norwegian Sea on March the 11th. Two hours before the asteroid impact, astronomers at an observatory in northern Hungary spotted the space rock heading our way. The initial findings were quickly sent to the Minor Planet Center. It's a sort of internationally recognized clearinghouse for position measurements of small celestial bodies. The Minor Planet Center quickly confirmed that this object was a previously unknown asteroid. In other words, it was something new. And additional observations were called for to further determine its exact trajectory. 
NASA's SCART Impact Hazard Assessment System undertook a further 14 observations over 40 minutes, eventually concluding that an Earth impact was likely, with a possible impact location, Ground Zero, extending from western Greenland to a position just off the coast of Norway. It then alerted the Centre for Near-Earth Object Studies, as well as NASA's Planetary Defence Coordination Office. As more and more observatories began tracking the asteroid, additional calculations of its trajectory and likely impact location were made, each becoming more and more precise. Scout eventually determined that 2022 EB-5 would enter Earth's atmosphere southwest of Jan Mayen, a Norwegian island some 470 kilometres off the east coast of Greenland and northeast of Iceland. 2022 EB-5 hit the atmosphere just as predicted, with ultrasound detectors confirming an airburst had occurred exactly when predicted. Based on observations of the asteroid as it approached Earth and the energy measured in the infrasound detectors at the time of the impact, 2022 EB-5 would have been about 2 metres wide. Small asteroids this size hit the Earth roughly every 10 months or so, but very few are detected before impact because they're so small and faint, making them hard to see. 2022 EB-5 is only the fifth asteroid to be detected in space before hitting the Earth's atmosphere. The first, which we covered on Space Time's predecessor star stuff, was the 4 metre wide asteroid 2008 TC3, which entered the atmosphere and broke up over Sudan in October 2008, scattering hundreds of small meteorite fragments across the Nubian desert. Two new NASA missions to asteroids are featured in this month's issue of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. Joining us now with all the details is the magazine's editor, Jonathan Nally. Yeah, good day, Stuart. So in the March issue of Australian Sky and Telescope, we take a look at some new space missions that are being sent to explore some of the asteroids in the solar system. Now, asteroids have sometimes been called, well, I like to call them, the builder's rubble of the solar system, the leftover bits from when the planets formed, the stuff that just didn't get swept up into any of the rocky planets or Jupiter or whatever, and they've just been floating around there in their own orbits for a long, long time. Now, there are lots of different types of asteroids depending on exactly what sort of stuff they're made of. You get rocky, rocky ones of this kind and rocky ones of that kind. And they're found in different places throughout the solar system too. Everyone's heard of the asteroid belt. The asteroid belt is a series of orbits between Mars and Jupiter. But some of these asteroids get caught in uh, locations called the Lagrange positions between uh, or, or either before or after a planet along in its orbit. So Jupiter's got a lot of these. And they're called the Trojans and they're sort of spaced out ahead of Jupiter in its orbit and spaced out behind as well. No pun there on spaced out. I really, I really do mean spaced out. So anyway, spacecraft have visited or flown by 14 asteroids. I was surprised by that. I knew that we'd gone to quite a few, but we're 14 by now. One of those asteroids even had its own small moon. That was the asteroid Ida, and it's a little tiny moon called Dactyl. Now, in the magazine, we look at two new missions, though. Two new missions. One's called Lucy, and the other one's called Psyche. Now, Lucy, which is named after the famous, or was it a hominin of some kind discovered in Africa? You know, the, the bones of the... Um, they it found was the Australopithecus hominid. That being a sort of uh, like a Rosetta stone, if you like, of hominins, they think the same thing of asteroids. Asteroids are sort of like time capsules of stuff left over from this early part of the solar system. Therefore, by going and exploring asteroids, you're, you're, you're looking at a sort of pristine material, or largely pristine material from the beginning or the origin of the solar system. So Lucy is named because of that. Now, it's going to fly past at least seven asteroids, of these ones that are caught in Jupiter's orbit around the sun. So that should be pretty good, green one after the other. It'll take a while to do that, but fingers crossed all goes well with that one. And the other mission called Psyche, which sounds strange, but it's going to be visiting an asteroid that actually has that name, asteroid Psyche. And this one is in the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Now, this so, is the yeah, one they think is full of minerals that could be mined at some stage because of its composition. Yeah, look, at mining asteroids has been a, a long a long, a long theme of science fiction and other things, and uh, some people are really keen to get out there and do it. And, you know, the, some of the, the storylines have been, uh, you know, some of these asteroids, of course, have stacks and stacks of platinum. And so, oh, I'll, go out, I'll be rich, I'll go out and get all this platinum and bring it back. But, of course, if you bring back too much platinum, the, uh, the price of platinum is just going to collapse <laughs> because of oversupply. 
And, uh, you know, what was the point of the whole thing? But um, I guess one day when we do, maybe when Elon Musk starts colonizing all the planets and we're going to need some more materials or something, uh, asteroids might be uh, what we can mine for that. Well, the race is on now between NASA and SpaceX to see who's going to send people to Mars first, isn't it? NASA are talking about the 2030s. Elon's looking a bit sooner than that, it seems. Yes. Well, Elon always has um, ambitious timescales, doesn't he? Yeah, uh, whether it's car, cars or this or that or, or, or space missions, but you know, good on him. Well, um, Tesla is the most popular car sold in Australia at the moment. That's right. You know, he's a disruptor, and that's, that's what you sort of need. And for some of these sort of things, it's going to need to be out of the hands, I think, of government because government moves very slowly, very cautiously. Whereas private industry can do things a bit quicker if you have someone with a bit of vision like he does. So, whatever you think of Elon Musk, he, he certainly does get things done one way or the other. So um, anyway, back to the back to these two missions. So what, the idea of this is pretty much what we talked about, mining and everything. Is they want to go out and find more about the chemical makeup of these asteroids and try and work out where they come from. Did they form where they currently are? Or did they form in some other part of the solar system and they've migrated one way or the other to a different part of the solar system? So asteroids are fascinating beasts. They were overlooked for many, many, many years by astronomers. They were just interesting things that people spotted and catalogued and thought about really because they just were thought to be rocks floating through space. When did that but change? Never... Was that when Shoemaker Levy slammed into Jupiter? Is that sort of when politicians realised, hey, we better keep an eye on these things and listen to the scientists? Is, is that sort of when that all changed? That certainly helped, yeah, because that, that's another aspect of the whole thing too is that, you know, they are potentially dangerous to, uh, to us here on Earth, so we need to know more about them. And, yeah, when you saw the effect that the the fragments of Shoemaker Levy 9 had when they crashed into Jupiter. I thought, wow, that, that really does cause some damage. Imagine what it would do to our planet. Um, so more money became available, and then they uh, started cataloging as many as they possibly could. The idea was to catalog you know, more than 90% of the large ones and, and um, find out where they are, what their trajectories are, what their orbits are, and work those orbits ahead to see whether they're going to ever, ever be a danger to us. And look, it's, it's undoubted that one day, whether it's hundred years from now, a thousand years or a million years from now, one of them is going to be heading towards us. So um, we do need to know about them. Uh, you sort of need to know your enemy. So if, if you want to go out and divert one, you know what you're getting into. You, hopefully you're not going to just break it up into lots of smaller bits that keep heading towards you. You want to uh, have some options up your sleeve. So when did it all happen? Yeah, mid-90s, that was 94, Shoemaker Levy 9. But it sort of started to, well, a lot of scientists, well, a handful of scientists, I've been trying to get people's attention on this prior to that, but just with better telescopes and things, and then with the advent of digital cameras that the astronomers could use at their observatories rather than the old glass photographic plates and things or film, they could do a lot more efficient work and they could see fainter and dimmer things. You know, they just started discovering more of them. I think it's the old thing of, you know, when they went looking for them, they actually found a lot of them. They found more than they thought that were out there. So they, they really didn't think there were too many, but then they found there's just lots and lots and lots of them of all different sizes. Is it so, the um, situation that uh, Space Watch primarily looks after the Northern Hemisphere and here south of the equator, we're pretty much left alone. We don't know what's really out there heading our way. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure about the answer to that, but what I do know is that for people like you and I who live in Australia, um, we have we, we, we have we're in far more danger of dying from snake bite or spider bite or shark bite or crocodile bite or anything like that than we are of an asteroid that might wipe out the Earth. Isn't that right? In my case, it'll probably be either a pizza or a hamburger bite, but yeah. Ah, uh, no, the, 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 the pizza asteroids, uh, the pizza, <laughs> yes, no, you, you, space, space food sticks or something. Well, they were supposed to be healthy, weren't they? Have you ever tried those? They were yes, awesome. yes, I did. Well, I liked them, but I was only about 12 at the time when I tried them. So it was a stuff called space ice cream or something, and it was just the most revolting stuff. Now, I'll, I'll stick to my very healthy diet of salad. Very if, impressed. And, and, and if you believe that, I've got a bridge I want to say. This. That's Jonathan Alley, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And this is Space Time. Still to come, a Nova event demonstrates a cosmic particle accelerator at its limit. And later in the science report, a new study has confirmed that people who suffer from autism and or ADHD have a higher risk of early death. All that and more still to come on Space Time. (laughs) 
thanks to a nova event and with the help of special telescopes, astronomers have been able to observe a cosmic particle accelerator as never before. Observations made with the High Energy Spectroscopic System HES, a gamma-ray telescope based in Namibia, show for the first time the course of an acceleration process in a powerful eruption known as a nova on the surface of a white dwarf star. A nova creates a shockwave which tears through the surrounding interstellar medium, pulling particles with it and then accelerating them to extreme energies. A report in the journal Science says the nova, which occurred in Aris Ophiuchi, caused particles to accelerate to speeds reaching the theoretical limit, corresponding to ideal conditions. White dwarves are the slowly cooling exposed cores of dead sun-like stars, which have had their outer layers blown away after dropping off the main sequence. Novae occur when a white dwarf is in a close binary system with another star and begins pulling material off its companion. Once enough material is gathered onto the surface, temperatures and pressures trigger a thermonuclear explosion, not enough to destroy the white dwarf, but enough to burn off most of the additional material in a blinding flash that can be seen light years away. The white dwarf then begins drawing off more material from its binary companion, and the process repeats often over and over and over again. Iris Ophiuchi is a binary system comprising a white dwarf and a red giant located some 5,000 light years away, which goes through the nova process every 15 to 20 years. The study's lead author, Alison Mitchell from the Friedrich Alexander University, says the stars in the Iris Ophiuchi system are about 150 million kilometres apart, about the same distance from each other as the Earth is from the Sun. When the system's last nova exploded in August 2021, the HESS telescopes allowed Mitchell and colleagues to observe the galactic explosion in very high gamma rays for the first time. The authors observed that the particles were accelerated to energy several times higher than those previously observed in novae events. Additionally, the energy released as a result of the explosion was transformed extremely efficiently into accelerated protons and heavy ions, such that the particle's acceleration matched the maximum speeds which had been calculated in theoretical models. The observation that the theoretical limit for particle acceleration can actually be reached in genuine cosmic shock waves has enormous implications for astrophysics. See, it suggests that the acceleration process could be just as efficient as in their more extreme relative supernovae, the explosive destruction of a star. Astronomers speculate that sometime in the next 100,000 years, enough matter will have accumulated on the Iris Ophiuchi white dwarf to push it over the Chandrasekhar limit of 1.4 solar masses, causing a far more powerful and cataclysmic supernova explosion. During the last nova eruption of Iris Ophiuchi, researchers were able for the first time to follow the development of the nova in real time, allowing them to observe and study cosmic particle acceleration as if they were watching a film. In fact, the authors were able to measure high-energy gamma rays up to a month after the explosion. This is Space Time. Time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study has shown that people on the autism spectrum and those with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, are at a higher risk of dying early than the general population. The findings, reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association, are based on a meta-analysis of multiple previous studies. When researchers looked at the causes of death, they found that both autism and ADHD were linked to a higher risk of death from unnatural causes such as injury, poisoning or suicide. Interestingly, the study also found that people with autism also had an increased risk of dying from natural causes as well. A new study warns that older people who have a lower level of folate, that is vitamin B9 in their blood, may be at a higher risk of dementia and death. The findings, reported in the Journal of Evidence-Based Mental Health, found that people aged 60 to 75 who were deficient in folate were 68% more likely to be diagnosed with dementia and nearly three times as likely to die from any cause over the next four years. The authors say the studies clearly show that folate levels need to be routinely monitored and deficiencies corrected in older age. 
In Australia, bread and flour have been fortified with folic acid since 2009, which has helped to reduce the presence of folate deficiency. A new study warns that meat from endangered species such as shark could be hiding in poorly labelled pet food. The findings, reported in the journal Frontiers of Marine Science, are based on a careful analysis of pet food available for sale to the public. Scientists found that pet food with genetic ingredients labelled simply as fish, ocean fish or white bait often include shark meat, with 31% of the 144 samples they tested returning positive results for shark DNA. The authors say more stringent labelling regulations are needed so consumers have a better idea of what they're buying, with some beauty products also at risk of containing shark-derived material. And this week's contender for what's got to be the silliest story is the haunted doll Annie, a sort of real-life version, for want of a better term, of Chucky of Hollywood horror movie fame. The demonic doll, which looks an itsy-bitsy like Betty Davis in the movie What Have Happened to Baby Jane, needs apparently to be kept behind glass and under 24-hour surveillance because it's claimed she weeps acid tears and tries to set herself on fire. It said Annie was found in the ruins of a fatal house fire and then purchased at an auction in Transal, I mean Pennsylvania. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics says the possessed doll is claimed to have caused all sorts of strange paranormal happenings. It's now being set up in a in a, uh, a British sort of uh, By someone who house. hates their children for sure. Yeah, no, it was to scare the children. It's a um, creepy it, looking doll too. Annie is this doll which apparently helped burn down a house in which the owners of that house in America died, that the owners still are present in the doll, even though it's now in the UK. The doll tries to set itself on fire occasionally, and it weeps acid tears. Um, if it weeps acid, I don't know how long the doll's going to last, you know, because normally dolls are made out of some sort of plastic. But, uh, and it depends on the acid, I suppose, that's how it re- reacts to the plastic. But the owners put this doll in a glass case so as uh, to try and stop it setting things on fire. But it's fairly obvious that he's painted makeup on it. <laughs> make it look scarier. And it's such a cliched, scary-looking doll that, honestly, you look at it and think, if, if anyone could be impressed by that, they are the most impressionable people you could ever meet, and I want to sell them a bridge. I mean, the history of haunted dolls and poltergeist in dolls has been around for a while. I don't even know if you remember a film, actually, in the mid-40s, which was a fair while ago, called Dark of Night, which had Michael Redgrave with a ventriloquist doll that sort of comes alive and starts doing terrible things. And movies love scary dolls, and that's where Chucky comes in, of course, which is a film that about a, a rather scary doll um, that's been around. The film has been around now for, what, 20, 30 years or something. And the guy um, behind all this, he's got a rather interesting name too, hasn't he? Yes, this is the guy. So the film who owns it name is uh, uh, Matt Paranormal. As opposed to Shiny Paranormal? Yeah, no, yeah. He, he, well, he's well finished, okay? But, I mean, I don't think that's his real name. Matt Paranormal with Annie, the self-immolating doll that uh, weeps acid tears and has the most appalling makeup you've ever seen to make it look scary. It's I get stories about dolls all the time, about scary dolls. Oh, really? um, easily, easily sort of uh, several times a week about scary Sometimes it's the same doll, right? It becomes a famous doll that everyone comes to visit. And apparently a lot of people are coming to visit Matt and Annie. And they're always unimpressive. The doll, sometimes they just look like ordinary dolls, but this person is obviously paint. I would say he's painted it on with a bit of makeup, to be yeah, dark rings around the eyes, and a bit of blood dripping off here, and that sort of stuff. And it's the things we used to see in the worst ghost trains. <laughs> so he um, he lives in Wales. He's thirty three, and he paints dolls, <laughs> and he keeps this one doll in a glass case. Okay, yeah. I, I know all I need to know about him. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know. <laughs> what do you do when you... Some of these stories... Some of these, that's why I don't normally publish doll stories and photos or films of ghosts in the newsletter very often um, because most of them are just so unimpressive. It's hardly worth the effort of actually clicking on it and looking at the film, even if they do show anything interesting. There's one recently so with a door opening and closing and the person saying, please open the door, please close the door. And you think, really? If that's the best you can do out of a public guy, I'd ask him to, you know, lift me off the ground and that sort of stuff. But no, opening and closing a door is pretty inane. That's Tim Mendham from... Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. 
Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Space Time YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. And Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 